I am absolutely thrilled that you're here. This is Dana from IT Path. Let's jump right in to an interview with Chrissy and Rudy, who have a lot of experience in cybersecurity. You are listening to the IT Path Podcast. I'm your host, Dana Morrison. Let's go and help you claim your journey into IT. Welcome back to the IT Path Podcast. I'm your host, Dana Morrison. I've been doing some unplanned traveling this summer, but I am back home now with my home mic and recording equipment. It's good to be home. And today we have two very special guests, Rudy or Ornelas. Did I say it right? Okay, cool. And Chrissy Conklin. Welcome. Hey. Yeah, it's good to have both of you here. Today we are going to dive into the world of IT training. In particular, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity. Both Rudy and Chrissy have 16 years-ish, I think, a piece in uh Cybersecurity. I'm going to let each of you speak a little bit about that. And Chrissy, ladies first, uh, why don't you go ahead? Tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. So I guess I don't have like the typical I love IT story. Uh, I had no intention of getting into computers when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, even like a young adult. Uh, so um, I joined the Navy when I was 20, um, and they just kind of stuck me in a job. I wanted to be a cook uh, when I joined the Navy, and uh, they wouldn't let me. They, You know, the recruiter tells you, oh, you're not allowed to do that, right? Like, oh, you're not allowed to do that, and you need to feel special, you know? And uh, So they made me an electronics technician. So Was that the, like, the last thing on your, on, on your list, or...? Yeah, I, I was like, okay, they, they gave me a bonus, which is how they sold me, right? Like, 20-year-old with credit cards and, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Here's the extra $15,000, you know, come do stuff with us. And I said, okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I was an electronics technician. Um, I had to go to school for a year with the Navy, but it was essentially um, layer one, layer two, really. So the physical medium like cabling and um yeah. hardware like the circuit boards and all that stuff and then um, a little bit of networking but yeah. not not the traditional it networking right like um for huge communications equipment satellites and that kind of thing um so layer one and layer two um do uh, either one of you want to speak real quick some of our our listeners probably don't understand the osi model would would one of you like to just give a quick overview uh, sure. So the OSI model is kind of like a mental model for people to break down how communication happens within a um, you know, computer network. Right? Um, it goes from layer one to layer seven, um, layer one being as close to the um, bits, the ones and zeros as possible, um, and layer seven being the application layer where um, the stuff that you know, you know as a user happens. Right, so um, there's a, a sweet acronym to remember it, like please do not throw sausage pizza away. Right, so it's um, physical, the data link, um, networking, transport, session, uh, presentation, and application. I have to say it in my head. Wow, every time. Repeat, uh, <laughs> repeat the acronym one more time. <laughs> please do not throw sausage pizza away. Uh, that's cool. Yeah, but it's um it's not um a literal um thing, right? Like it's just a way for you to break down um the function of different concepts within everything that has to happen when communications happen on a network, right? So um, when I say I work in layer one and layer two, I um, work on the physical connections between systems, right? So the actual cables that you plug into the computer and you plug into the wall. Um, and then the net, um, the data link, right? So um, getting those physical things, even though there's a connection to it, they still have to tell them how to talk to each other. Um, so that's what I was doing, um, was getting the things to talk to each other at a very basic level. Cool. 
Uh, so yeah, so so you got your start in that. I mean, how, were you, did you do that for your entire time in that? or I mean, had... No, um, I did that for eight years. So I was in the Navy total 15 years. 15? So the first okay. eight years I did um, as an electronics technician. Um, a lot of it was um, uh, not very glamorous. I was checking battery voltages on AA batteries, <laughs> making sure it was intolerance, um, vacuuming out uh, filters out of the back of you know, these huge radios that were talking to submarines and stuff. And um, so it wasn't always glamorous. It was a lot of climbing ladders and checking, you know, voltages on antennas and stuff. But I did learn the basics of how, um, you know, one machine talks to the other. To the other. And I did have to troubleshoot a lot when, there were, when the comms went down, right? So um, there was a lot of that. But another thing that I did, which is completely off subject is it's not off subject because it's what I did when I was little you know but um I worked in a nuclear support facility so I calibrated the radiax from the Geiger counters oh wow um, okay yeah so um I worked on a ship that took care of nuclear submarines and I was um in charge of the shop that calibrated the radiax so that people knew how much radiation was they were being exposed to um, so I learned, I, I wore the Homer Simpson suit, you know, like the yellow nice. thing with the orange gloves and um, cleaned right. up radioactive spills and stuff. So I did that along with the right. filters and stuff. So it was pretty cool. Um, well, you didn't have to say don't very often, did you? No, I, I said it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that um, led to uh, eventually, and we don't have time to dig into all yeah. of the little things that where, where your path led, but that led to what you're doing now, which is? Yeah, um, I do, I'm basically a cybersecurity analyst, I guess. So um, um, I've done a little bit of everything, but I guess the, for the most part, I do um, cybersecurity analysis um, and engineering maybe a little bit. Um, so after the eight years of me vacuuming filters and stuff, the Navy was like, we need you to do something else. Uh, so they offered me this, other role as a they call it cryptological technician networking um which is the Navy's way of saying cybersecurity analyst um and cryptological uh, technician. technician yeah i got a thunderstorm going on here by the way so if any really? thunder comes over my, my zoom does a pretty good job of filtering out noises but i don't have any yeah. idea how loud it's gonna get it, i can't hear it so. techno uh, uh cryptological technician all right yep. yeah. cool yeah, so they sent me to school for six months, and that's where Rudy and I actually met. Um, and this school was insane. Um, it was eight hours a day of just a fire hose of information. Um, and then you know, go back to your barracks room or your you know, hotel room, wherever you're staying, and um, study for six more hours um, just to be able to keep up. Um, because, wow. yeah, it was – they took – uh, they took you everything from discrete math was our first module um, all the way to um, exploitation and everything in between. So we literally learned how um, the electrons came out of the wall into the computer and how the electrons oh moved through the computer. Goodness. Yeah. Um, all the way from the ones and zero level all the way up to how to exploit everything that you learned about in the modules before. Wow, that's crazy. So uh, you were in the Navy for 15 years. Yes. Yeah. And it's the, really for you, it's the sum total of all of this experience, which has led for what you do today, which mm -hmm. is cybersecurity analyst. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, let's 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 pivot. Rudy, give us your story. My story. Uh, you know, I'm just some guy. Uh, <laughs> so uh, after high school, I did uh, Navy things. I wasn't always a nerd, uh, but... Or maybe deep down inside, as always, the nerd, right? Um, side note is that I'm a firm believer. Nerds have options, meaning at any point in time, they can they can be cool. They just choose not to, you know? So oh, I love it. Right? So yeah. uh, wear that badge. Um, so, yeah, I joined the Navy. Initial My initial job was in um, CTN, same thing as, as Chrissy, which is Cryptologic Technician TAC Networks, right? You have different flavors of CTs. Uh, CTRs, well, might be signals, Intel, uh, CTIs, which are interpreters. And then there's a, a whole gambit. But 
the CTNs didn't exist back then. Um, this was in 2001. I listed uh, on my 18th birthday, November 2001, and two months after uh, September 11th. So um, mm. I went off, did some Navy things. I had a pretty eclectic career. Um, I ended up getting out in 2006 in December, 2006, and I, uh, 10 months later, actually, I got recalled, um, then spent 420 days in, in Afghanistan. When I was recalled, um, there was about 135 of us sailors um, that were attached to uh, an Army unit, right? 101st Airborne at the time. And so, uh, but half of them, have these other sailors were reservists, right? And then the other half were the unfortunate that had been recalled, right? So I learned about the reserves back then. Um, and essentially what, when it came down to it, the way I interpret it is that they got paid for waiting, right? Like your number would get called. Like, um, so I joined the reserves then. Um, a couple months later, I uh, started to learn about other rates. A rate in the Navy is just a job. Um, so like Chrissy spoke about her being an ET prior to becoming a CTN. And so um, I learned about the CTN, right? Uh, and it actually took a while for me to, to get the school. You have to, um, I had to retake certain ASVAB scores. Not that my scores at the time didn't, didn't uh, get me like the minimum scores to get in. It's just um, I had a better chance if I retook it and then I submitted higher scores. That and some other aptitude exams and just to get the school. Uh, and so I, I, I dibble dabbled in, in IT, uh, but backing up a little bit further, like I always say that God's funny because when I was in high school, I didn't want anything to do with business, um, computers, or, or and I had no interest in government, right? And so <laughs> uh, what is it? Four decades, I am I'm interested in authoring. So you know, I, I don't know. You, you've I, you've heard some of my backstory. I got a D in my first. Uh, I don't know if I told you this. Did I tell you this? I, I got a D. It's posted on the podcast too. But I got a D in precalculus, and I got a D in my first programming class, which was Pascal at the time, which was even obsolete then. Then being ninety four, and so I got booted basically from my minor, and they put me in uh, what I call affectionately the dumb class where <laughs> they teach you how to study and yeah. it wasn't that i was bad at math or that i was bad at programming but i honestly didn't even have a home computer at the time i had some kids from a youth group help me build my first computer and that's where you know and it was like i went from like uh everything you know i did not take any of that in in college i actually took theology and now I'm just, I'm doing IT stuff and I love it. It's like you were saying, like, God's weird. It's weird that the path that we end up going down that leads us to some of these places, but a um, little rabbit trail there. So, so continue on uh, in your story there. Yeah, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, I think uh, we had the same output or not output, but uh, outlook on um some of the past, right? And but a lot of this, right? Uh, when you zoom out, uh, what's it mean? It's not that I went and became a CTN. I tried for the school is that um, you keep on pushing for something better. You don't know what better like constitutes fully, right? You don't know it in detail. You just know it's over there, right? And I gesture like somewhere over in the yonder. And um, well, when I learned about what the CTN was, it, it was a it was a rate coming of its own, right? Newly minted. Um, they took some because there was a need at the time, right? Um, early 2000s, mid 2000s, um, you're, there's a lot of uh, cyber security, you know, whatever it is, right? And most people, uh, they, they chop it up to, you know, somebody in their, in their basement, in their mom's basement with a hoodie, right? And then cranking pale skin and a bunch of like uh, Doritos bags around them. But that's not what cybersecurity is, right? Um, it, really what it is is, it's um, learning how things work, uh, solving puzzles. And, and IT in general is, is like that, where it just turns into cybersecurity is, um, all right, I know how it works, how do you break it? All right? And then um, thereafter, if you want to become the good guy right, or good girl, uh, the good side is going to be, um, I, know how to, I know how it works, I know how to build it, 
I know how to break it. Now, how do I mitigate it? How do I hunt for those that want to break it? Because you know how those interconnections. Chrissy's talked uh, earlier about uh, in the school, we learn how like the actual electrons flow uh, on a wire, right? And then we can map that to something that that is from academia, which is, let's say, the OSI map, right? We know that there's one through seven. First one is physical. Second one is data layer. Three, a third one is going to be network, right? And it goes on. But that first one, physical, what does that mean? That's a physical medium, right? Um, talking about fiber optics, light, pulsing, right? Um, electrons on a wire, copper, CAT5, right? Um, RJ45, which is Ethernet, right? Um, and so you learn all those pieces that, that constitute the whole. And that's like, it's a powerful statement, right? Because uh, you have to know all the pieces to constitute the whole. The whole is a system, right? And so when we say IT systems, cybersecurity systems, that's what it really means. It's, it's not just one application, one tool. It's how they work in conjunction with each other. That's the system. Um, and then, you know, zooming back out on my stories, um, everybody, uh, whether they like to admit it or not, whether they admit it to themselves in the shower or openly, uh, they're looking for their, their place in the system, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, zooming back to where I was in my career, I was doing, um, the reserves, um, but, um, that particular rate, the job that I had at the time, um, didn't really map to anything out in the civilian world right and then um i was going to school my my initial love of life was uh biology right but a lot of schooling and i had been recalled a couple of times even as a reservist i ended up going back but um i saw this opportunity with the ctns and it was like you know what the clandestine groups but for nerds right um and so i i'm like you know what i can i'll give it a try i've been fortunate where i got to partaking some of the, some brutal training in, in my life, right? Both in real life and then in the military. Um, and, uh, but this was different in that it was, it was like a, really a mental thing, right? Like uh, you become better than adversary at these ones and zeros, right? Binary off on and off. Uh, so that's what intrigued me about it. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, they were offering bonuses too. So that, that, that was nice, but. That helps. Um, <laughs> so I get to school. And um, I had some IT background maybe for about a year, maybe about 18 months of where I actually got my security plus and my net plus before I went there. So um, was that, but, that was that when you were not in the Navy that you achieved? I was in my, I was studying it um, before I got that, that rate change. And uh, this whole time I'm in the reserve. So, you know, I have a, reserve. it's like living uh, two lives. Uh, so I think, uh, JFK said that, you know, the, the reservist is twice the citizen because you really you're living two lives. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then for those that are listening and do have a thinking about the reserves or are in the reserves, like, uh, you know, wherever you can try to marry the two. Right. Um, but if you're looking for a difference, it's a, it's a perfect option. But know that there's options. Right. Don't get blindsided. Like, I wish my two careers mapped to each other. Um, or you're like, you know, I want something different. I work in the office all day and I want to drive tractors. So that's my spiel on the reserve side. But, um, so I, I, uh, went to the school and it was a humbling experience. I had my sec plus and my net plus, but I quickly realized that, you know, um, it's just a piece of paper and I mastered studying, uh, for an exam, not real world application. And so that to give you an idea of we're talking about programming, right? My first language that I learned was C++ and it was in JCAC. So the, the school that we go to is JCAC, uh, JCAC, which is Joint Cyber Analysis Course. Um, my class started off with 39. Um, it's about six and a half months long. 11 of us graduated. Um, it has a really high attrition rate. I think the school average at that time was about 87% attrition rate. Um, and whoa, was, whoa, whoa! Repeat this. What? Okay, so J J T A C is that what you said? C A C, the Joint Cyber yeah. Analysis Course. Okay, and you said you repeat that percentage. You said eighty-seven percent. You're saying eighty-seven percent didn't stay in. Yeah, did, didn't um, didn't successfully pass okay. right uh, wow. to come out the other end, and so. And so if you example pass, was, you're already in the 13 percentile. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it 
again, it takes a while to get into it. They're very selective on who gets there, right? Um, the the psychologists and and whoever's accepting resumes, if you will, right? Uh, from outside the Navy and internally, which is cross rating, right? Switching jobs, which what me and Chrissy did. Keep in mind at that time, it's a new rate, right? So it was only about two years into it. They, they needed to fill seats, but they didn't want to dilute who's going to fill those seats because of the job, right? The mission set. Um, so um, some stats from their side is going to be, um, let's say you only felt, you're only allowed to fail once, like an exam. And so uh, meaning if you fail twice the same exam, um, you, since you, you kicked out, you could um, advocate for like a, a board, right? Uh, and, um, but I can tell you right now, like I don't know what the numbers of those, but I only see one case where somebody actually went to the board after failing twice an exam. Um, and then the board said that they gave them a thumbs up to stay, right? Stay in school, but you got one more shot. And it really has to be meaning like, um, you know, usually it's like a death of family maybe, right? Or maybe they, um, they're sick, like they had the flu and they were out for like a whole week. So they, they missed a lot of curriculum. Um, but for the most part, you know, if you're not studying, if you're not pushing, um, then you don't want to be here and that's okay. Um, but we got to move you because what's coming out the other end, meaning those that are walking the stage, so to speak, um, they're going straight to uh, field, right? Which is going to be that digital field for us. But uh, so it was very humbling. So when I learned how to program, right, I didn't have any programming experience when I went th to that school. Um, my first module is broken up to 60 modules at that time. It was anyways. And so that module was introduction to programming, learning C++. Usually every module, you have two exams. One is a practical, and then one is written. Written, uh, pretty much anything that comes to mind, uh, multiple choice kind of thing. Still arduous, uh, but it's, it's, it's that traditional kind of scan sheet format. Uh, the practical is whatever the, the flavor of the module is. So if that module was programming, you're going to have a programming um, practical exam. And uh, for that one, I give you about 600 lines of code. None of that IDE, let me log into here. And then use some of that uh, the fancy buttons from this IDE to help zoom in or control F fine kind of thing. Like literally it was printed out, right? It was printed out 600 lines. And then you have to figure out what, what the heck this program is doing and then why it's failing. Wow. Right. And so like you have to go line by line with the, with the pencil, <laughs> some scratch sheet paper. And wow. so but calling you have to functions and, and all of that yep. to follow the functions and then come back and, and the return statements or whatever they are in C++ and trying to decipher maybe a return statements giving you an integer and it should have been a string or. Oh, instead of like a computer RAM you're using your mental RAM. Right. And so oh, like you're, wow. you're, and so I'm, I'm always reminded of the dodgeball, you know, if you dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. So it's kind of like that mentality. That was my, like uh, on that fourth day, it was nine days. That whole module was nine days, right? So it's, you're drinking from fire hydrant, um, all this knowledge, right? And keep in mind, like a lot of us in that class never programmed before. There was one guy, um, uh, Chrissy knows who I'm talking about too, but uh, and he, he graduated from Rutgers computer science degree. Like he, he was a programmer, right? He joined uh, the Navy, and now he's in this class. He's been in the Navy for a while, um, and he's um, he was really excited about this module, right? Uh, but I remember on that fourth day, like after after class, after that eight hours of drinking knowledge with the, uh, from the fire hydrant, he looked at me. He's a, he goes, "Rudy, I don't I don't know how you're doing it." And then I was just kind of uh, dazed. I was like, "What do you mean?" He goes, uh, he goes, I, I didn't learn object oriented programming, right? Which is uh, um, uh, a method within programming, right? Um, but you have to learn a lot of fundamentals before you get there. He says, Rudy, I don't know how doing this because I didn't learn object oriented programming until my third year at Rutgers, right? His computer science degree to his third year, his junior year. And then here we are, day four, and um, I'm trying to understand it, right? Where I'm bashing on the keyboard, I feel like a uh, you know, like a Neanderthal man or something, right? Awesome. So <laughs> that's awesome. But, but it, it it's mentally uh, it keeps you like we used to look forward to the weekends. Why do we look forward to the weekends? Because um, during the week it's a new subject. Every hour it's a new subject. Learn it um, where you watch. So it's uh, akin to um, 
hold my beer, watch this, right? Take notes along the way. And then it's, all right, you're going to drive, but you're only going to turn and press on the gas until when I give you direction, step by step all together. And then the third time, usually a hammering on a subject or a field is going to be, I'm going to watch you drive. I'm going to sit on the, the, the passenger side and I'm not going to say anything until you ask, right? Um, and that, that was every day, every hour, right? And so we look forward to the weekends because we wouldn't get any new information. It allowed us not to go party or what have you. It allowed us to to go to a coffee shop for like six hours and then um, regurgitate back to ourselves what we just learned in the last five days and um, and became rhythmic, right? And then what comes out on the other side is is uh, not just uh, you know a stuff, uh, you know things. Uh, it's it's how you map that. How do you find your way uh, to be like water, like whatever the subject is like you can you can figure it out it's not easy like nobody says it's going to be easy anybody that's selling you that is um they're, they're selling you know snake oil it's going to be can you figure out yes you can and then i'm going to teach you the tools to figure out which is like logic based right why we figure out like why gates discrete logic or lo these are the modules that we learn and then right. we apply that to how satellites work hey this is Dana Morrison, host of the IT Path Podcast, and I hope you are enjoying this week's episode. Are you interested in getting into IT? Let me ask you one simple question. What is holding you back? IT Path is dedicated to developing a community, content, and courses that will help you get unlocked and stay unlocked on your IT journey. I have more than 25 years experience in IT, and I want to share with you what I've learned and give you the tools to succeed on your very own IT path. Even if you are just starting out on your IT journey, we're here for you. To find out more, simply go to itpath.net and sign up for the mailing list, and we will start by sharing some tips, tricks, and tools to help you get going and keep you going. Go to itpath.net and claim your journey. Start your IT path today. Thank you so much, and let's get back to the episode. Man, I, I got to. I have a. We got to pause just for a second. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you. You're on just speaking to a lot of different things that I've observed. One of them is: <clears throat> Did they ever use a model assist watch leave? Have you ever heard that before? Model assist watch leave. I mean, what yes. you're describing is is a, is the is one of the best patterns for learning and that's like and what this really means is like you know a kid wants to ride a bike so the kid's watching so you know the kid hears about a bike sees somebody riding a bike and they're like i want to do that that's modeling right so they, i want to be the guy on the bike so then the person on the bike says okay well, here's kind of what i'm doing here's how to do it and they kind of walk beside you assist you a little bit and then last they're just kind of watching you hey fyi car's coming you know make sure you put time good should hit your brakes now or, or whatever and then eventually you leave and then that person carries it on the same pattern with somebody else eventually down the line you know it might not be tomorrow that they teach somebody how to ride a bike but probably at some point they're going to have opportunity to also be part of that process for an, for another person um so you also said, I'm going back to, to toward the beginning, you said nerds have options. Uh, and <clears throat> also how you had mentioned that people are looking for their place in the system. You know, you've got the and, and, and really, that is huge, because a lot of people get into IT, and they don't have any idea what they're looking for. They're trying to figure it out. Like, am I a programmer? Am I, uh, you know, do I, I just like working on hardware, you know, that electronic side of it, where maybe they get to 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 work directly interfacing with the computer hardware itself or or whatever, but they're they're trying to figure that out. And uh, I I have this question about this this whole intense training process from JTAC. Do you did you feel like in this that they're one of the one of the primary purposes for compressing all of this this learning and this this pattern of learning and and all of this was that. They're basically testing your ability to learn and adapt. Did you feel like that was that that's a side effect, or did you also think that maybe that was a goal of what they were doing? You know, uh, I'm always being. I was in Navy sixteen years, right, and so I love my country. But I always joke around that 
I don't know if it was premeditated, whether like it might have been a side effect, uh, side effect where you have this critical thinking. I like to think that a, it is by design. And I know some of the instructors, that's how they thought, right? But the larger system, you know, I don't know, but it, it does work. And why does it work is answering your question. Because what comes out the other end, the most valued part is not that that you had exposure to all these topics in a dictionary, right? So that you can pass a, an exam. It's that you you learn how to navigate that type of knowledge and how they it maps with each other. There isn't no start, stop. Or if you're looking at the OSI model, the different layers, right? From layer one to two is going to be physical to data, right? There is no, this is what, uh, like all of layer one, this is all the examples of layer one because there's a bleed, there's a gray, there's connectors, there's a substrate to layer two and then to layer three, layer four. And then when you zoom out, it's all one layer, right? Uh, where, and that's what makes up the internet, right? Uh, and so when you, you think like that and you apply it to um, dining or everything, then you start to realize like uh, cascading effects. But that, that whole, everything I just said is a, is a different way of thinking. It's like Bruce Lee says, you know, be like water. Like you, you find a way, you're fluid. Um, and it's not for everybody, but can anybody do it? Yes, right? Mm -hmm. um, they can. It's just you have to realize that um, it might be hard for you. And, and the reason it might be hard for you is because you're not used to it. Then you got to you gotta be honest with yourself, whether you really want it, right? Because in order to have it, you might have to change the way you think. And if you're not prepared for that every day, that's okay, but be honest. You can't make something that's a triangle fit in a round peg and then vice versa, mm -hmm. right? Like um, you have to mow to it, right? And then become that much better. And re really what you're doing is you're, you're, you're molding to fit. So then you're part of it. And then that goes back into the system. You are part of the system now, right? And not just, uh, you know, obsolete model, you might be the, the part that, you know, makes everything better, right? And then that is how to make that more akin to real world is going to be, uh, you will become like a SME, right? Or the intermediary, the manager, the director. And then you start to enhance, teach, uh, enable others. And so even that notion, you're working with other cogs, if you were on the machine. And then, so therefore, you became part of the system and then you made the whole system better, right? Because it proliferates, it's ripples in space, if you will. So, um, but being able to be fluid, um, when if you're going to like cybersecurity, like uh, that helps tremendously because when you look at like bad guys, they, they, they move at the speed of the internet, right? They're always trying to find a niche. They're like water. They're trying to find every little crack. And if you're playing, let's say defender, right? I, I always hesitate to say blue team, but that's uh, usually what the cybersecurity defenders, right? Those that are getting paid with it by a W2, um, they're referred to as blue teamers, right? Where the aggressor pen testers, you know, the, the offensive size, is red but if you want it like if you're a blue teamer right and that's where you consider your role you've already you've already started to limit yourself right because we live in the world of purple right where the bad guy they don't limit themselves right and if you're going there should be processes and procedures right they should know fundamentals um but if you can't pivot if you can't think outside the trapezoid like then then you're like everybody else thinking inside the box. Um, so uh, after school, after uh, JCAC, that, that's what I, I learned, right? Where I've been exposed to like hard physical things, but, um, and they were mentally taxing, but this was a different mental tax in that I realized that I can do it. I never, consi uh, never considered myself the, the smartest guy in the world, right? Um, it's just it's like Batman, right? Uh, enough willpower and time then um, I'll be better than your one thing. But I have a collection of one things. You said earlier where trying to, people trying to figure out whether they're a developer or a network guy or girl or what, whatever it is. Uh, in our industry, we get asked that a lot. Um, and I always give the same answer, which is I'm a Rudy. And then people uh, usually follow up. Like, no, but I mean, like, are you, you know, a network guy? And then I always say, I'm... No, I'm just the Rudy. And I said, but I'm probably the best one I know at it, right? Like, which is, I got, right. I'll figure yeah. it out. I, I don't like programming, but I'll do it because I know it, it, it gets me closer to whatever my task is, right? Um, whether it's graduating, whether it's building the next cyber weapon system, 
to um, or trying to automate, you know, a robot giving me a beer from the fridge. I'll figure it out. Right? <laughs> Do you have one of those? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but I'm put that on my. Oh, okay, so uh, man, there's there's so many directions we can go. I want to get back to Chrissy here, um, and then we get back. And I want you, Rudy, when I come back to you, I want you to be uh, to to tell us a little bit about like what's going on now. Uh, man, we, there's so many directions we can go, but one one thing that it's like uh, it's it's like the big elephant in the room that we have to talk about is this this differentiation. You, you know, you, you talked about the the guy from Rutgers who, uh, you know, was having his own issues, uh, keeping up with some of that coding and, and was questioning you, how are you able to keep up and, and, and all of that? And I'm sorry if you guys can hear background noise here. It's uh, it's storming here and there's a skylight right, <laughs> right next to me. So uh, there's some rain coming down. Um, can Chrissy, I know you have experience, a lot of experience with the education system, I know you've seen some of these things yourself. Can you speak a little bit to this, uh, like this idea of what, what Rudy was talking about with like this compressed learning atmosphere, but also this application and how greatly that differs from the world of certifications and just shoving people through an education system? Um, well, I think it comes down to um, I don't know, you know, what does it come down to? It's, so I was, I was a professor at a university, um, for a year. I recently stopped because I didn't like the academic, the traditional academic environment in the cybersecurity sense, because, um, like Rudy mentioned before, cybersecurity moves at the speed of the internet. The bad guys move at the speed of the internet, right? Um, academia, uh, doesn't do that. Um, and certifications don't do that, right? Like, um, yeah, certification boot camps are like six weeks and you can be security plus certified, right? But you're learning this extremely surface level stuff. You know, there that those that test is asking you uh, what port is SSH, what, um, you know, that kind of thing. And um, you have to know so much before you memorize that port for SSH, right? Like you have to know so much that's underneath that and those certifications don't cover that, right? And these certifications a lot of time are sold as, you know, you get security plus and you're guaranteed a job, you know, like it's the fast track to getting this job. So it's fast tracking these people into these jobs. Same thing with academia, right? It is um, pumping people through, right? But it's so surface level and it doesn't move at the speed of the internet. Um, Right, like the beautiful thing about JCAC was they could change that curriculum and update it on the fly, right? And because they were teaching it to you so quickly, if something changed that week, the the, the class behind you was gonna get the updated version of it, right? So they're pumping you through this um, wow. system that's, that's um, designed to evolve as the bad guys are evolving, as the technology is evolving, you know? Um, when Rudy and I went through that school, um, they were barely starting to talk about, um, like we had like one page about APIs, I think, like, I don't know, Rudy, if, if you remember something different, but we had very little bit of APIs. And now I, I deal with APIs like four, four or five times a day, you know, like I have to do something, Same like, here. And, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. like, um, so, and I mean, that, I mean, yeah, JCAC, it was 10 years ago, I guess, or eight years ago when we graduated from there. But, um, you know, like it moves so fast. But the beautiful thing about JCAC was they taught you the fundamentals, right? And API is just, um, you know, this concept that's the same thing as this older concept, right? It's just this new way of looking at it. And it's a new way of, of dealing with, you know, HTTP of web traffic, right? It's this new way of interacting with it um but because we knew the fundamentals it didn't take us long to adjust and be like okay this is what apis are and i mean it didn't take us long to go from you know a traditional server in iraq to um thinking about it in the cloud and then thinking about it as a container you know what i mean like like um, this world that we live in now is so different it's from so the start. different but because they taught us how the ones and zeros came through 
um, all the fundamentals of how all of those layers work together. And we can take that abstraction and place it on top of anything and figure it out, right? So that is what gave us the tool to be like water, to be able to adapt as the technology is adapting. And academia does not do that. And certifications do not do that. Here's right? a crazy story. I got a crazy story for you from education. So I'm working at a, a school and I'm the IT director and I'm looking at our firewall. And you, you had mentioned SSH, uh, you know, secure shell. I was working, uh, you know, on, a, on our firewall and, you know, I was reading up on best practices and, you know, how, you know, your FTP ports should be blocked. Nobody should be using FTP anymore. This is like in 2012. So it was like, nobody should be used. Nobody should have been using FTP in 2012. Right. And I know you're, you're laughing because you know, people that are probably using it that you've talked oh, with recently. So. Uh, I'll tell you the story as soon as you're done. Yeah, so, so then uh, I'm like, okay, well, we should obviously be blocking, you know, this and, and some other like SMB. Uh, and, you, and if you don't know what that is, you, go, you can go look it up, but it's a, it's a Windows file sharing protocol. So I block it from our firewall and I get a, a call from somebody in the office that says our student information system has stopped working. I'm like, well, that's strange. So I look and when they're when they're in their interface for their student information system, when they were clicking on student records in the bottom left hand corner of this application window, it wasn't a web browser, it was a it was a client application that was installed on the computer, you could see in the bottom left corner, it would say FTP, and then something, it was going out and doing a call via FTP to pull student information. And I, I was like, this can't be, this can't be. I walked back, I, I, I turned the, I turned that my block off. I walked back to the office, says, does it work now? She said, yes. And I said, I'm gonna share some information with you. And I went to my office and I did a, um, uh, I did a, 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 um, a packet capture. And I showed her the raw information that was going back and forth from our system out through the web, passwords and everything. And she was floored. She couldn't believe it. And I reached out to the uh, to the company, and I'm and their their response to me was, "Yeah, we've been meaning to fix that." The, how ever since this system had been developed, every every piece of information that they transferred was completely insecure. It's crazy. Yeah. So uh, right now I'm working. It's not cybersecurity related, but my my jam is automation and squeezing every last ounce of functionality out of the you know out of the tool right like the vulnerability scanning or um i think a sim um, all these different tools i figure out how to squeeze the most out of it so um right now rudy and i have this project we're automating a business process it's not cyber security related at all we just i just like doing it so i did it um I have to, first of all, I tried to use an API <laughs> to go and get information, right? Like I wanted to get information. They don't even offer that, right? They're like, oh, we only push information. And I'm like, all right, like it's not normal, like, but okay. Uh, so, I'm, so I'm trying to, we're trying to figure out this thing and bottom line, like it, it, just, it just doesn't work, right? And, and we're trying to integrate it with like this tool. I'm not gonna say it. I don't want to, because I'm going to badmouth it. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's um, all right. <laughs> don't, um, don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. So this um, this software, this third-party software that my client's paying me to integrate with, I'm trying to integrate it with Microsoft 365. Completely, like, baseline, like, pretty standard stuff, you know? Uh, so the API isn't working. And, and I'm like, okay, let's do this. The other option they have is, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll stand up an FTP server and you can come in and grab the file. I'm like, oh, right. no. no, but bro, like I was like, okay, they're just saying FTP, right? They can't possibly oh, they really, mean oh, it goodness. was FTP, oh, right? Like the same thing, username and password, and you're going in and grabbing. I mean, it's not like credit card numbers or anything, but it is PII. You're associating right. um, personally identifiable information. You're associating a person and an address and an email and a phone number. And it's just 
passing it in the clear. And I'm like in this meeting with these people and I'm like, um, you know, like that's really bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm trying to, I'm, I'm like, you guys really need to update your processes. This is insecure. And I know like part of what this and They're here's why I can I can set up I can set up a packet sniffer right now and I can show you in real time exactly why this is a bad idea. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, it's just absolutely crazy. Like, and and like no, but but the thing is, nobody's they've never been. Cha- They're like, oh, really? That's a problem. And I'm like, nobody's ever challenged you like using this insecure protocol before. And they're like, no, nah, like. I'm the, like, we're, Rudy and I are the only ones that are, child, like, you need to fix yourselves, but because it's this one little guy, like, you need to fix yourself. Oh, <laughs> like, they're gosh, not doing go, it. We can go down a, a <laughs> rabbit trail with that, too. Like, these small IT departments tend to do some very bad things. Ah, what happened to the audio? Why do we have to stop? Oh, my goodness. I hope your brain is being blown. This call is going to go on for two more episodes. And we're going to share absolutely as much as we can, uh, because what what Rudy and Chrissy to is speaking to the heart of what's going on in cybersecurity, but also what is go, going on in the heart of IT in general. And I hope that you just get a lot of nuggets to take away from this. We don't have time enough to squeeze it all in right here. Come back for part two next week. <music> You have been listening to the IT Path Podcast. Did you like this episode? Why not subscribe and share with others? IT Path is dedicated to helping you claim your IT journey. You can find out more at itpath.net.